Let's go, Lo-Fi Poli Sci coming at you. Michael Pickering here with our good friend Gregory Day, a writer, director, bookseller, and the voice behind Hipsville AD, the fanatical sector god of subculture and fervent ramblings of all breeds of cinematic pleasure. How are we doing out there today, Gregory Day? Oh, I am fantastic. How are you? I'm um, doing good, doing good. Surviving the heat and chilling. Excited mm-hmm. to talk about the top 10 movie list you've got going on for us today. And what is your top 10 movie list for us? Yeah, this is an exciting one. I'm uh, looking forward to talking about it. We're doing a top 10 list that is spotlighting female directors. I like it. I like it a lot. So all 10 films today directed by women. Most excellent. Let's jump right into it, my friend. What do you have for us coming in at number 10? Yeah, number 10 is River of Grass from 1994, directed by Kelly Reichardt. Uh, this is a great little indie flick from the mid-90s, a uh, little quirky kind of love-on-the-run movie about a, a dissatisfied housewife who hooks up with this sort of this vagrant guy, uh, and they start doing house robberies, and they think they actually accidentally kill someone, so they go on a run. Um, and it's a great uh, comedy drama about these two misfits who just can't fit into society. Uh, but it's very emotionally uh, honest and kind of, you know, shows that this type of lifestyle isn't sustainable and, you know, how they kind of drift uh, apart along the way. Um, so, yeah, this is a great film. Uh, it's a debut film by Kelly Reichardt, who we talked about a little bit before on this show. Uh, she directed Meek's Cutoff and Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women. Uh, she's one of the premier indie filmmakers in America right now. This is her first feature going back to 94. And it's a great little picture. Uh, and you can kind of trace a lot of her themes back to this movie about this desolate, uh, economically desolate American existence and um, the women that are trapped in these existences. So uh, this is a great flick. And uh, if you're looking for that little, little scratch, that little indie vibe um, that you need, I uh, highly recommend this one. I like it. I like that description. And that, that's pretty much the, the gist of what I got from the trailers, because I had never saw this one or heard of it uh, for that matter. But it definitely felt like the, the story of two people just on the run, trying to figure things out, you know, trying to, to answer that question, like, what is our thing? What are, what are we doing here? And I feel like that's such a a 1990s question, you know, going in right before the new millennia, everyone's just like, even I, I was like, what is this thing of mine? Like, what am I doing here? And so to follow like just two people on their journey, to me, that's a really cool premise for a movie. Um, you don't need all these like billion dollar action set pieces sometimes. Sometimes you just need to follow two people's love stories and to see how they live life. So I like it. I like it a lot, sir. Well, what do you have coming in at number nine? Yeah, number nine is a classic Hollywood picture called Dance Girl Dance. Uh, it's directed by Dorothy Arzner, and this film came out in 1940. Uh, this is a really great picture of two women competing um, with each other on this, uh, at their job as, as chorus dancers. Uh, one of them is a classically trained ballerina, and the other is a burlesque dancer. And so they have very different styles of dancing, but they're also from different backgrounds. And so it's this, this not only this competition between women uh, professionally, but it's also about the class and um you know, their backgrounds. And so uh, the burlesque dancer in this film is played by Lucille Ball, which I think is a really cool thing to go back and see her pre I Love Lucy career, where she was kind of both a dramatic and, and comedic actor, very successful. Um, and yeah, this is a, this is a directed by Dorothy Arzner, who was one of the few female directors um, of this time period. She was a long time editor and script writer in the Hollywood studio system. But um, as a, you know, as, as someone who could be who was, I would say, given the chance to direct by the men because they controlled everything. Um, she was one of the few who who did it during this time. And uh, if you watch this film, she's a great filmmaker. Um, this is one I had trouble finding a trailer for, but it is out and around. The Criterion Collection just put out a restoration of this. So um, while you can't really see good highlights of the film online, I would you know you can go out and actually track this one down and give it a watch. So when I started the trailer, like. I immediately recognized the lead actress, but I couldn't put my finger on from where. And you just said from the Lucia Ball show, uh, it was Lucio. So I was like, it clicks now. I'm like, that's where. But in 1940, like, wow, um, I hadn't seen this one or heard of this one. But just the fact that there was a female director in the year 1940, amazing. And more amazing is the the second clip that you sent me was just like a, let me set it up for the people at home. So I'm I'm queuing up the trailers and I get to this. The first clip is Lucille Ball in the dance studio with the other female lead in the dance studio. And you can kind of get the vibe of like competition. 
But the second clip, it's one of the lead female actresses on stage and she's performing and things kind of seem like they're falling apart and the crowd start heckling the woman, but just the men. Now there are like women in the crowd, but it's just the men heckling the woman. And the woman's about to like lose it and go off stage. And then she clicks and she walks back up and she goes on this wonderful monologue where she just basically tells all these misogynistic motherfuckers to fuck off mm -hmm. and, yeah. <laughs> and starts going off on them. She's like, all of you paid 50 cents to come look at a woman dressed like me whenever you can't even look at your wife like that. And it's just like, basically her monologue felt like a commentary on misogyny in 1940. And the fact that this was a female director who did this in 1940, I thought was just amazing. Like, was so you already said that it was rare for a woman to be directing in 1940. If you do know of any others, like is this one, and especially like that monologue in a film, is it set apart or is it kind of like when women do direct in this era of male dominated Hollywood, are they all kind of like this? Do you know? No, no I mean, there are there were a, other, a couple other women uh, who were directors around this time, Ida Lupino being one of the other really famous ones. Uh, she she was maybe a little after this, but no, I think this is a this is a rare thing to have that in a movie at this time. Um, you know, there are a lot of other films that that deal with like you know quote unquote women's issues of like abortion and and, and pregnant out of wedlock stuff like that, but not to the point of like just you know coming at men and and kind of putting them in their place for their their treatment of the of the women characters. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely something unique to this film. Uh, it's it's phenomenal. Eighty two years ago this film yeah, came yeah. out and yeah. like i said um people this is a treat i was very surprised i dig it yeah i would say one one of the things that i, what I really love about this this film is specific to the scene that i sent you with lucille ball doing the hula dance is that mm -hmm. uh this is a film directed by a woman but it's it's that specific scene is from the point of view of the the casting guy at that club and it's mm -hmm. the way she's dancing and the, like the seductive nature of it but it puts you in the audience's point of view of him and the way that it's shot today, we would shoot a, a, a dance sequence in a lot of cuts to kind of like accent different spots of, of the, of the dance, but the scene is in one long shot and it just slowly flows with her dance. And this is the seduction. Uh, and you really feel it because you're just watching a performer in a wide open space and the camera is just slowly going with her. Um, and so I think it's just highly effective. And uh, from a filmmaking point, um, perspective, I would say that um, these are the kind of techniques that really work, that really suck audiences in, that don't feel overproduced or over, um, you know, or the, the, the filmmakers don't trust um, the performers or the technique of which they have to, you know, to to suck you in. So I think this is a great example of watching a movie and, and seeing how cinematic techniques work. Oh, I, I like that. I couldn't agree more. And I also kind of felt like the fact that there are no cut sequences and that it's just following the dancer and it is made to kind of feel like the perspective of um the audition editor i, I forget what you call them the terminology but the person who's uh, basically choosing dancers and whatnot like he was just leering over her <laughs> yeah, right yeah. like he was just following her and staring at her and it, it the idea that you can show that perspective and that that women would feel this way that people were just staring at them constantly and you can use one shot instead of a cut shot or a series of cut shots to make us as an audience feel that i think that is really good film techniques um, and like you said it's a different way to to tell a story without actually having to say the words in the movie themselves mm -hmm. um, like you don't need the dancer holding up a sign saying you're staring at me you can see it just <laughs> by having one long shot yeah with a camera and i think that's a phenomenal idea all right, my friend, what do we have for number eight? Yeah, number eight is Pariah from 2011, directed by Dee Reese. Uh, this is a great modern indie flick uh, set in Brooklyn. And it's about this teen who's uh, struggling with her sexuality and her race and the overlap of that. It's uh, set in an African-American community. And this teenager who has a struggle with the conformity of her family, who doesn't necessarily support her um, support the fact that she is gay um, and she's struggling to come out to them, but she's has to go out uh, in different clothes before she gets to the school and changing her clothes or, or when she's hanging out with her friends. And so it's kind of this, the story of this woman, this coming of age story where she's 
struggling to to you know reconcile her sexuality with her family and it's the story of her mother who can't who just can't uh accept it and um it's a great movie like set in uh modern america does a great job of like showing what brooklyn is like these days and like the different um you know the different settings how these traditional american uh values are still deep rooted in these families even though when this character leaves you know there's uh, a lot of acceptance in her friends or, or in public spaces but um maybe not so much in the home and so uh yeah this is a great feature film from uh i think i believe this is a uh d reese's first feature film um so yeah it's it's really great it just got a criterion release so um go out there check it down and um yeah what if we just like a great slice of american cinema this one i haven't seen but damn this trailer was powerful and i really want to see this movie uh you know, about a young African-American woman struggling with her identity. But I mean, the movie raises the question in so many different ways, right? Like at first it's, it's like, okay, okay, what does it mean to be a human? And it's like, what, is it, what does it mean to be a woman? And it's like, what does it mean to be African-American? What does it mean to be part of the LGBTQ plus community? And then to put all of it together and say, what does it mean to be an African-American woman that is part of the LGBT plus community? And how does the world and your own family treat you because of that identity? Mm -hmm. Like, damn, you know, trailers, trailers normally just kind of give you a storyline and you're like, okay, I'm in or I'm out. Like, you don't really get an emotional pull from it. But this trailer, I mean, it really pulled me into this story. And I want to check this one out a lot. Man, great yeah. pick, very great pick. And to put all and think about it, to put all of those different things on a teenager, someone who's Right. Has no world experience. He's just trying to figure it out, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, it's a difficult situation uh, for anyone to, to struggle with. So this is a, uh, this film does a great, uh, it does a great job like exploring that. I like it. I like it a lot. I'm going to check this one out for sure. All right. What do we have for number seven? Yeah. Number seven is our uh, genre pick uh, for this list. Uh, <laughs> it is a uh, probably the most, uh, grimy offensive horror film and one of the most grimy offensive horror films i think ever made it's called blood diner from 1987 directed by jackie kong uh she's a horror filmmaker slash comp comedian comedic filmmaker i guess you could say um and this is a film that she made that is as bloody as it is funny and so it's sort of a looney tunes kind of uh horror film about these two brothers who run a health food store and they're guided by the uh, talking brain of their dead serial killer uncle, uh, who is who is uh, pushing them to kill women to build to chop up their bodies to build a host body for this god they want to resurrect. And uh, they serve the remaining parts of the bodies at their health food, uh, their vegan restaurant, basically. And so it's like a big takedown of um, LA yuppie culture and health food culture. And it's even got digs at professional wrestling and hollywood and just so many different things going on in the film it's all it's all a big parody it's almost like um like a naked gun kind of parody or a mad magazine parody style um but it's a it's sort of a retelling of the uh great drive-in horror flick blood feast and about um you know chopping up women and making this host for this god to come in and then things go horribly awry once the god does inherit the body um but yeah this is a this is a great uh, kind of like midnight movie that uh, you don't really see a lot of women making or less, you know, much less writing and directing um, this type of film. And so this is one that kind of falls by the wayside, but I'm very excited to, uh, you know, hopefully introduce it to new audiences and, uh, you know, see something that's a little, little uh, off the beaten path. Off the beaten path is an understatement. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen this one, but the trailer, my friend, whenever it started rolling and I was like, oh, this is a genre flick. I am not surprised at all. I was like, this definitely like, I got the automatic like parody film of horror and zombies, but I mean, still I dug the trailer a lot. And when I think of genre films of the 1980s, I kind of have to wonder, and you kind of addressed it like, how many women were prominent as directors in genre horror films during that day and age? What, what, what do you think? Ooh, uh, you know, you could probably count them in one, one hand. Uh, not, not a lot. That's what I, I kind of imagined, but I don't know much about genre, so I wanted to ask you. But um, 
also kind of clue people into like the quirkiness of this film. And so this came out in 1987. And at the end of the trailer, it cuts to a black screen with words and someone's narrating the words. Um, and I just love the way the trailer ended with its little catch line. And it's like, blood diner. First they greet you and then they eat you. <laughs> No one under 17 at night. It's like, it's like, all right, yeah, I got you. So like, I don't even think NC-17 was much of a rating used in the 1980s. But the fact that they said no one under 17 yeah. admitted, it means yes. this, this film was NC-17. Yeah. Yeah. And or, for a film to be yeah, NC-17 so. in the 1980s, yeah. yes. damn, dude, damn. Yeah, yeah. I will say that even though this movie is very funny, it's very politically charged. Even though all of it is like political satire, but there is a really um, pointed moment where they go and they kill a bunch of women who were doing topless aerobics. And so there's like a group of women jumping around this room and then the, the two guys roll in with machine guns with Ronald Reagan masks on and just annihilate these women um, and then start cleaning up and chopping up the bodies in this, in this gym. And um just doing that in 87 with a Ronald Reagan mask, you know, mowing down these women um, says a that's lot a, where they're that's coming a, from. That's a huge statement about saying what Ronald Reagan thinks about women's rights. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a major commentary. This is an interesting pick. And like you said, directed <laughs> by a woman with that kind of commentary. That's very interesting, man, especially for the time that it came out. Oh, yeah. All right, and where are we going for number six? Yeah, number six is a, a, a movie called Song of the Exile. It's from 1990. It's from Hong Kong. It's by uh, directed by Anne Hui. Uh, this is a pick I chose. I feel like I really wanted to talk about it. Uh, it's a film that is impossible to find uh, nowadays, but I wanted to put it out there in case it does ever get a uh, restored re-release. -re and um, just to, you know, remember the name if you're listening out there and you're interested in this film, because um, if it does get a re-release, you're, you're going to want to see it. It's uh, it's about this. Uh, it's set in the '70s, and it's about this uh, young woman who comes back to Hong Kong after studying abroad, and um, finds out that there's something going on at home, and and, and that you know, it kind of re resurface or makes these emotions resurface of her mother, uh, and how the difficult relationship she has with her mother. And her mother is Japanese, and so she's the main character is half Japanese, half half uh, Chinese, and uh, this trip home starts to bring up all these ugly memories but also she starts to hear stories of her mother's uh youth and it kind of brings up the trauma of the post uh of post world war ii and the sado japanese war and the the struggle of her mother as a young woman as an immigrant living in hong kong and being separated from her family and she becomes to understand her mother's uh point of view in, in life and the hardship she had to, to go through uh and maybe didn't translate to her being the most caring mother but you know it did Put her into position to make sure her, her daughter was taken care of and her, got an education and had had um, opportunities that she didn't and so um this is her kind of working through her resentments from her mother and kind of understanding her mother um and so yeah this is a really great film from the time period this is the hong kong new wave um before like the action um guys really took over that movement and so these are really good uh social political drama and uh yeah if you get the opportunity to see this one hopefully it'll get a re-release and a re restoration at some point in our lives um this is a must see I like it. And, and this trailer for me, I really like how there was no dialogue. And, and so because the trailer was in Chinese and the, the Chinese characters were different places. So say, for instance, in another trailer, you know, it may not have any words, but the, the narration in words written on the trailers written in English, you can kind of get a feel with the music. And if the music's in English, it doesn't matter that there's no dialogue. Um, because you still have English coming at you. You have your own language. But this was different. So the the background music was a singer singing in, which it sounded like Japanese, um, although you said the movie's from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, but you said, like, the lead is half Chinese, half Japanese. Um, so even, like, that duality, like, you're kind of like, well, is this Chinese? Is this Japanese? Regardless, I, I don't speak either. So the music was just a feeling. And then anytime characters came up, like words that would clue in a viewer to like what this scene is about, they were Chinese characters or maybe Japanese characters um, or maybe both. And, and I don't read either. So it's like I had even less to go off on uh, or to go off of, except for I knew the name of the movie was Song of Exile. And from that, I just had to feel the music and watch the story and 
the motion picture as it was taking place. And I really got a lot of the vibes that you were talking about, like the conflict of the duality of who you are, because there were some scenes that were distinctly Chinese in nature, but there were other scenes where she was wearing a Komodo and it was distinctly Japanese in nature. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, so is this a Chinese or a Japanese film? And then, you know, you come and you tell me, it's like, okay, Hong Kong, New Wave, which by the way, I'm not surprised you bring in Hong Kong, New Wave again, you always do. Um, but this was a phenomenal trailer that still gripped me, even though I had no, no cues as far as linguistically to go off of, except for the name of the film, Song of Exile. Um, but I do want to ask you now that, you know, you did say it as part of the Hong Kong New Wave. And for those who listen to uh, your top tens with us all the time, you regularly bring in the Hong Kong New Wave. But when we talk about it, normally it's like action. Um, so I want to ask you, in the Hong Kong New Wave, how prominent is it to have a female director of film? Uh, I think at this time, Anne Hui was probably the only director of the movement. I think there were some, some people who came later, some women who came later, uh, Mabel Chong and some others, uh, but that's the late 80s. Um, but she was like the, the predominant female uh, artist of the, of the original movement. And um, and just to clarify, this movement has this kind of two pronged. So, like at the beginning of the '80s, coming out of the '70s, there were like these social, politically conscious directors, and they started to make more films uh, that were less, uh, you know, less like the kung fu films uh, coming from the studios or big budgeted films coming from the studios, and they were more grounded in realism and like exploring character dynamics and stuff. Uh, but then the second half was like really where like your John Wu and other action filmmakers came in and started revitalizing um, action, but also sometimes had a socio-political slant to them. Uh, and then of course that exploded in like, you know, went around the world. Um, and so it kind of took over that, um, that character-driven socio-political, you know, drama and stuff. Um, but Anne Hui, who uh, we discussed previously, um, did Boat People as well. Boat people. That that sounds familiar. Refresh me. What is what is boat people? Yeah, it's an early '80s flick from from Hue about a, a photographer from Hong Kong who goes down to um, Vietnam after the war is ended and is kind of documenting oh, yeah. the the, the uh, lifestyle or the uh, conditions, I should say. Of, yeah, we uh, have country. talked about that one for sure. Yeah, no, I dig this one a lot. Um, and like I said, it's hard to really tell what this is. And you said it's impossible to get why is that what's the deal with that it's just gone it's just uh I, the only version i've ever seen of this was on a vhs and i watched that i don't know how many years ago uh but there's no dvd there's no blu-ray there's no restored version of it it's just lost to time and i'm just hoping because i think it's such a fantastic film um i think that it's um one that we, it really needs a restoration and deserves to be out there i am interested to see why that just disappeared um but an, another conversation maybe another top 10 to another top 10 <laughs> movies that are now banned or that have disappeared a banned top 10 Ooh, list banned. that would be mm. interesting yeah anyway anyway all right let's go on now we're getting to your top five and what do you have coming in at number five for us yeah uh, these next couple are from different new wave movements uh this one is from 1966 it's called daisies directed by vera uh, make sure I don't, uh, or I may butcher her last name. It's uh, Chitlova, uh, Chitlova, Vera Chitlova. Uh, this is from the Czech New Wave of the 1960s. Uh, this is a feminist film about two women who are fed up with their lot in life and decide they're going to scam businessmen out of high-priced meals and uh, train travel and just all kind of, they're just kind of taking advantage of all these like sleazy businessmen uh, just to live it up because they don't really have much else to live for. Um, but uh, it's the style of the film that is really revolutionary and it's just like this real surreal style of people like they're cutting their heads off and they're floating around it's having a good time there's food fights and just these weird color palettes over the film and, uh, some 3d effects uh, even though the film is not in 3d at all it's just kind of weird um interplay of all these different color spectrums and um yeah it's just uh this you know sort of reaction to society and both the, the technique of the film and both the subject of the subject matter of the film uh, from a new wave that was definitely taking influence from the French um, and just wanting to break all the rules. And uh, this, this film certainly does that. Oh, I loved, I loved how this film started off um, with the trailer. Um, just like 
the two women were just like, nah, nothing's going on. Everything's going to shit. Fuck it. And then boom, <laughs> it just jumps in and they're like, check, new wave surrealist cinema. And like you said, you see yeah. like the floating head and it's like calling all wildflowers. And it's like, oh, I dug this the moment it started going off. And I was just like, <laughs> two people in the 1960s just saying, fuck it. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're going to do it. Um, and, and so interestingly enough, the fact that that's happening in 1966, Czech New Wave Cinema. People, you have to remember. So at this point, we're not talking about the Czech Republic, which exists today. We're talking about Czechoslovakia, which mm -hmm. is part of the Soviet Union. And this film comes out in 1966. Now, I haven't seen the whole film, but from what I've seen in the trailer, it looks like this would piss off some Soviet communists, <laughs> to say the least. I was just like, damn, this is awesome, cool. Um, did it have any kind of commentary that it was like, going against like Eastern Bloc communism, Soviet, was any of that in or did it stay away from it? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole idea of like the gluttonous lifestyle that they're aiming for, just like running up these huge tabs at restaurants and eating as much as they can and just wasting food. And there's also a lot of uh, trespassing going on in this film and just like, uh, but uh, you know, maybe it's a little, uh, it's aiming at the hypocrisy of things because there is a lot of um, terrorizing of the bourgeois class in this. Um, and that whole that you know that kind of um, hypocrisy of of communist society that also has a bourgeois class. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a radical film, and um, you know it's it's very brave of a lot of filmmakers in these countries during these times to make films like this. Oh, without a doubt, it looked it looked fantastic. It really did. Um, and and that brings us into which I already know your next new wave. So you got three new waves in a row so far. Yeah, Where are you going yeah. to with your number four? Yeah, so this is a. Uh, Cleo from five to seven from 1962 directed by the great Agnes Varda uh this is her, probably her first masterpiece of her career but this is uh a nouvelle vogue um uh, the French new wave like which is the most probably the most impactful movement in cinema history um this is you know to, to kind of talk about it again with this movement of French filmmakers who just decided to throw all the rules out the window and make movies that were both playful um and kind of played with the rules of cinema but also just kind of uh, explore different things for their characters. And uh, Agnes Varda, um, who really kicked off a new wave before Truffaut and before uh, Godard uh, with some of her early films, but this is a film that she made in 62 that's um, just a great character study of this singer who is told by a fortune teller that she is uh, ill. And so she goes to the doctor and gets tested and she's you're just kind of with her for these two hours of her life as she's awaiting the hospital results. Um, and she's got in her mind that she's going to die. And so it's just her kind of bumming around Paris and meeting different people in her life. And it's shot in this, you know, it's definitely a new way of filming. You see the editing techniques and the, the off-kilter camera work. Um, but it's it's a movie populated with reflective services. So it's not only about her herself, but how she how sees herself, how the public sees her. Um, and all these things kind of wrapped together in this uh, this two-hour odyssey that this character goes through. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, Varda is one of the greatest filmmakers ever, and this is her first masterpiece uh, from a long career. I mean, she passed away re very recently in the last couple of years, and she continued make making very impactful films her entire life. Um, and yeah, if you want to watch a, a great new wave film, um, this is this is this is one of them. Agnes Varda is the one director on this list that I'm quite familiar with. I took a, a French film or a French cinema class in undergraduate and uh, Agnes Varda was very prominent in that class. And especially when we got to the French New Wave or like you said, La Nouvelle Vogue, um, the idea that, so I hadn't seen this one of hers uh, and, and it really looks cool. But when I think of Agnes Varda and I think of her inside of the French New Wave, the French New Wave was very much about revolutionizing what cinema could be as far as how you can make a film. But to me, Agnes Varda always represented not just that portion of it, but it also represented who can make a film. And to me, that was one of the most important aspects of the French New Wave, was the fact that not only could you make a film completely different than what you thought you could, a woman could make a film any way that she wants as well. Um, oh, yeah. And it really added this extra dynamic. And like you said, you know, the French New Wave is probably one of the most powerful um, cinematic waves in the 1900s, if not for all cinema history. And I think Agnes Varda was revolutionary in that, in pushing the forefront of that women can make movies however they wish as well. And this French new wave will not just be dominated by French men. Um, and like you said, Agnes Varda, 
I remember watching her movies in the early 2000s, like that she made movies in the early 2000s that were still phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And those movies were 50 years after this movie you're talking about, Cleo from yeah. five to seven. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you were, you're debuting one of her uh, movies from 1962, and I've seen some of her movies from the early 2000s, that's well over 50 years of cinema making history, um, this one woman. So I think this is a great pick for sure. All right, well, where are we going for number three? Yeah, if we're sticking uh, to France here. We're going to talk about a film from 1999 called Beau Travail, directed by Claire Denis. Uh, Claire Denis is one of my favorite filmmakers working today, and she's been working for you know, the last 40 years or so, making just a ton of masterpieces. Um, this, is a, this is the only film on this list that focuses on masculinity. Um, it's her French Foreign Legion adaptation of Billy Budd uh, about these this troop of uh, legionnaires who are you know, preparing for or training for war. It's never going to come. They're in the desert. And it's about the homoeroticism of this group of men out in the desert. Um, yeah. And it's like her, her style is, is it, it, she has this elliptical style where she kind of purposely omits, uh, you know, points of the plot. And so it makes for a more active viewing uh, experience for the audience to kind of like make sure you're paying attention to, to the, what's happening in the film. And uh, she's she has a great way of focusing on you know the effects of colonialism and sexuality and explorations of the the physical uh, you know the nature of having a body and she is able to kind of wrap all these things up in all of her films no matter what the subject is but this one specifically um, showing these men in who are in peak physical condition um, deal with the world around them and deal with the, the the fact that they're in the desert you know just is a place that's you know not really French um, and so yeah it's just you know this lingering effects of colonialism these men preparing for war but it's also uh so it's how lonely and disconnected they are from from any you know, kind of real society um but one note about her filmmaking technique i will say that uh she is the master of the final scene of a film i won't spoil the scene of this movie the last scene of this movie even though it's um 23 years old uh but even if you watch it out of context you're not really going to get it but she has this great way of just punctuating her films um almost like just slamming a book shut on you as an audience with a final scene uh she doesn't play you out she doesn't slowly roll you know slowly uh exit you out of the cinema she just drops a final scene it wraps up the movie really well and uh, sometimes it's a revelation of like what the scene is and this one is one of her most uh probably her most famous ending and um yeah it's a must see you gotta check this one out yeah i dig it and I want to start by briefly talking to people about what the, the French Foreign Legion is, uh, because I feel like it's not really something we have anything to compare to um, in the U.S. military system. So the French Foreign Legion is a, a group of you know people, um, although we'll, they don't necessarily have to be mainland France. Um, I don't want to get into it like too, too much, but there's a way to where like from their former colonies, depending on the circumstances, if you serve in the French Foreign Legion, you can get French citizenship and then go to France. Uh, but the French Foreign Legion is basically, it was created to extend the French military to the colonies without necessarily having to send all of the French military there. Um, and it's made of like a bunch of different groups of people from different places. And to see how Claire Denis captures, like you said, the homoeroticism of these men out in the desert, because the French foreign legions were normally out in the middle of nowhere. They were just point blank put in places. That way, if something happened in a huge radius in any direction, then the foreign legion would go. You know, that's it. <laughs> um, and, and you could get like her filming techniques of like the lingering stares of like a shirtless man being stared at by like his commanding officer um, or like a bunch of men playing in the water at the beach together and stuff like that. Um, and the name of the film I love, um, Beau Travail, which means beautiful work or working beautifully. Um, and to think that that name with what she has and how she's filming it about the French Foreign League region, I think this is a really unique perspective on what France was really doing out there and what takes place on the frontier. Like, what are these French soldiers really doing? Um, I think it's really cool. I hadn't seen this one, but I have heard of Claire Denis before. It's a good pick. I like it, man. I like it. All right. And where are we going for your number two? Yeah, we're going all the way back to 1970 
for a little picture called Wanda, directed by Barbara Loden. Uh, this is a film written, directed, and starring uh, Loden as this woman who was utterly lost in her life. Um, she's a incompetent housewife. She has no self-esteem. She abandons her family and her, her husband and her children and goes on the road with this petty criminal. And uh, it's just a portrait of this woman who has kind of fallen through the cracks of society and has no ambition and has no real idea of who she is or any self-worth. Um, and so it's a very startling movie coming out of the 60s. Um, you know, I think we're still in cinema and American cinema specifically looking at idealized American lives. And here's this, this picture about this woman who, um, you know, saying a lot at this time period, a woman who would abandon her children, who has no no uh, feelings for her, for her children it has no self-worth and um it also, i think it's also an indictment of the american society is you know uh, you know keeping women uneducated and and um, shackled in, in in housewife roles and stuff and so this woman is not prepared for anything outside of of domestic life and then domestic life has gotten to a point where she can't take it anymore and so um yeah this is uh, one of the few films of this time uh, and I can't even think of another one really. So maybe the only one that's written, directed and starring um, the same woman. And to be this honest about many parts of our country uh, during this time, the economic uh, problems uh, specific to women. And then um, you have this movie star. She was, just, Barbara Loden was this, you know, kind of um, semi-famous movie star she wasn't a you know an a-lister but she was she was married to uh eli kazan who is the you know, one of the most famous hollywood directors he did a streetcar named desire and on the waterfront and many other classic films um that kind of blended um you know the hollywood studio system with some social realism but then um his his wife for a little bit of time comes out with this film she's like she kind of rejects all of um the studio you know polish Polish studio efforts uh, to make her first film on 16 millimeter and just lays bare this uh, indictment of how America treats women. I, I, I dig this trailer so much. Uh, and I, I really can't add more than what you've already said because you, you, you painted a great description you know, of the complexities of life and transitioning of the country at that time, but also um, gender roles at that time and women and the the story that Barbara Loden was telling in her own perspective. And I think you're right. Whenever I think this film came out in 1970, I cannot think of a single other woman writer, director, and star of a film. Um, so much so that I was like, this was 52 years ago. I was like, there has to be more, right? I was like, <laughs> there has to be. So I, I, I did a little a little bit of research. Um, these are your lists, but I did create a little bit of a list Ooh, okay. inside of your list. So I, I was like, there has to be some other ones that um, now now some of the ones I'm going to say they didn't write them necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of them they did, but they were starring and directed by. Um, so some ones that I found was In a World by Lake Bell, uh, Whip It by Drew Barrymore, Little Man Tate the Beaver by Jodie Foster. Um, I Hate Valentine's Day by Nia Vardalos, um, The Anniversary Party by Jennifer Jason Lee, By the Sea by Angelina Jolie, Unicorn Store by Brie Larson, that one's pretty new, and The Watermelon Woman by Cheryl Dunny, which is also pretty new. Um, and I did find a few others, but these were some of the more prominent ones that I saw. And I saw there is one coming out. I think Natalie Portman has one that she's writing, directing, and starring in. But I was like, wow, I was like, I looked at this list and then I looked at the list of men who have directed and starred in their own films. And it was uncomparable, you know, truly uncomparable with the numbers and the disparity between them. Um, but I, I'm curious and I don't know this one. And, and perhaps you can tell us, like you said, there wasn't really anyone during the 1970s who was doing what Barbara Loden was doing as far as writing, directing and starring. Did she start a transition to where we see it more or did she do it? And then it was still a long time before more women started being directors and actors uh, starring in their own film. Do you know? Yeah, this is an anomaly. I mean, this is a film okay. that was uh, made and I don't, I don't think Barbara Loden was even in a movie again after this. And she didn't direct another movie after this. And um, 
this movie was actually kind of lost for a very long time. And it wasn't until the last few years that it started to really uh, start to resurface. Um, and then of course it got a restoration and it was re-released. Uh, and so now it's kind of reevaluated as this great work of art, but I think it just kind of came and went and disappeared. Um, and so, yeah, there wasn't, wasn't like it sparked some kind of revolution or, or change in culture. Um, there are some other films, like I guess like uh, a new leaf by Elaine May would be one that I would say is, in this time period but that's a it's a farcical comedy um and she already had a pre-existing career as a tv comedian um and so when you get a film that's this like starkly realistic and about social problems um this is just something that's not really happening um it, it's not really being made by women starring women written by women uh, at this time Interesting. And that, that's what I was really curious about. Um, was this an anomaly? Was it an, an outlier? Was it like, the, it could have been the beginning of something, but because Hollywood's dominated by men, it wasn't the beginning of something. Um, it was just a start in the 1970s. And then it was a while before others. Um, but maybe we can come back to that topic in a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. But let's let's go ahead and switch to your number one. And, and let me ask you real quick. Is so... Is this like your number one favorite film directed by a woman, or is this just out of these ten, this is your number one? Uh, it may be. It may very well be my favorite film directed by a woman, but it's also just one of my favorite films in general. Um, and so, putting this list together, I didn't really want to make it like this film's better than that film and so forth. But kind of ranking them together, I think this one is uh, has to ring at the top because it's just a massive work of art. Um, Give it to us. What do you and, got? And, and yeah, okay, let's get to it. It's a is John Delman, twenty three, Quad de Commerce, ten eighty, Brussels. Uh, it's from nineteen seventy five, directed by Chantal Ackerman. Uh, I think we've talked about this film once before um, on the show, um, and I forget why. I think it was maybe for the technique, uh, but it is a three and a half hour odyssey about a housewife um, in her home, and the whole movie basically is in her home, watching her do her her daily chores, her cooking, her cleaning, and the raising of her son. And she takes the occasional job from a John, like doing sex work to make ends meet. Uh, she is a widow, and um, the movie is told completely through visual um, clues. There's no dialogue about what's going on with Sean, what's happening inside of her head, what's what are her uh, fears and anxieties, or her um, her wants and needs. And so you're just watching her daily routine very meticulously, which is why it's three and a half hours. But uh, one day her schedule gets mixed up, and she has a whole hour not assigned to do something around the house and so she kind of has this this moment where she reflects upon her life and then after that we start to see her struggling with the chores that we watched in the first hour uh, and you're slowly watching this amazing performance um, of this woman uh you know shaving um or skinning potatoes or dropping a spoon and you're seeing how all these imperfections in her performance as a, as a housewife um you know, she's coming unglued. Um, and it's just a fantastic, fantastic piece of art. Um, and Chanta Akram, the director, made this movie when she was, I think, 24. Um, and it's the same age as Orson Welles was when he made uh, Citizen Kane. So, like, I just feel like this movie is as important as that movie. Uh, and it's just like an anomaly for a young person to make such a monumental piece of art. Uh, but this movie was made as, as an effort for her to try to understand and reject her mother's generation of women it's the post-war housewives in um france and in um in uh, sorry not denmark in um in brussels um and so you know it's her kind of like explore you know kind of her not saying i want to be a housewife and i'm not into this lifestyle but trying to come to a, a, an understanding of like not only is a housewife life different from mine but also like what is beneath the surface of, of a life of duty like this and so um yeah it's it's a it's a amazing movie uh with such a simple premise and um a great central performance you know this this trailer was awesome i mean without knowing what you just said when i was watching the trailer um you know i i feel like what i got from it kind of parallels your description but in a little bit of different way. So to, to cue it up, a visual image for listeners out there, when the trailer starts, split your screen into four squares. And in one screen, one of the squares in the upper left-hand corner, the lead woman 
you start watching a video of her doing a chore in the kitchen. And the other three boxes are different quotes by critics or different things talking about the movie itself, but there's no dialogue. Then a second one of the squares pictures, a new video pops up and it's another one of her doing chores in the kitchen. And slowly all four squares are populating your screen with four videos of her doing different chores in the kitchen. Like you said, skinning potatoes, doing dishes, cooking, all kinds of things. And you know, you get the idea that this film is very much focusing on what a woman is doing in a house. Like you said, this film came out in 1975. It was a post-World War II film. Um, and you kind of get this view of work. Like she's working. She's doing a lot of work. And especially when you're watching four different videos going on, you're like, she's doing a whole lot. And then the, it cuts to the end of the trailer and the whole screen populates to one picture of her just sitting down with her legs up, just like relaxing for a minute um, after she's doing all of this work. And then it cuts and you're kind of left with thinking, at least I was thinking, you know, like if this would have been a film directed by a man, and if it, they would have been talking about the world through a man's view, the movie would have started right at the end with someone walking in the door and it would have followed a man's journey in the world and his work life in the world. And everything that she was doing in those four different videos that you were watching all at the same time and all the work at home would have been completely passed over. And instead, this is like taking that misogynistic view of homework isn't work, which is completely bullshit. You know, mm -hmm. it's taking that narrative and throwing it out and saying, you know what, look, we do a whole, whole lot. And you just gloss over it like it's nothing. And then for you to tell me that it's like, really her rejection of that life, that women were supposed to be doing that thing, I think fits in perfectly with it. You know, the fact that like, the trailer was trying to get me to think like, this was what things were supposed to be like in those days and age, and she completely rejects it. Um, so I think like, and you said three and a half hours, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's got such a hypnotic t uh, rhythm to it. Uh, so each of those screens you were you were just describing is is like a scene from the movie. So it's you're not watching them in the actual movie, you know, in it simultaneously. You're watching just the one scene, right? Um, right. And so it's like you're watching her do this thing, and you're watching her do it over and over and over again. Um, and then you, it's when you start to see her making mistakes in her daily tasks that you really start to feel that uh, that that suspense coming through that that something's on edge. Um, and it's yeah, even though it's it's three and a half hours, it really sucks you in, and it really goes by quickly um, because it does become such a suspenseful film where you're just you're leaning forward in your seat trying to figure out what the hell's going on and what is going to happen to this woman because you can definitely tell that something is bubbling up uh beneath the surface oh, i dig it i dig it a lot this was this one seems really really interesting to me and i think i could sit down for three and a half hours and find out just what's going on with <laughs> this one i like it i like it all right and that is your top 10 list gregory day and let me let's start off by saying what about some runners up? Because, you know, 10 films is, it's quite limiting, right? So mm -hmm. you have any mm -hmm. quick shout outs you want to give to, to some side lists that you have, but you couldn't quite fit onto the, your top 10? Yeah, yeah. There's two films I want to just give a quick shout out to. Uh, one is an Iranian film called The Day I Became a Woman. It came out in, I think, the year 2000. Uh, and it's, these, uh, it's told these three short vignettes about women at different uh, ages. And but they kind of got all go together and... Um, it's very surreal at times and but it's really about the oppression that they go through at different ages um in um, or by men um or in the iranian society um and there's another film called variety uh that is really great it's an american film from the late 70s or early 80s um it's sort of uh akin to vertigo but it's like sort of, or i guess it's called the female vertigo about a woman who takes a job at a box in the box office at a adult theater in Times Square back there in the old sleazy days of Times Square and she becomes obsessed with one of the male patrons there and it kind of takes her down this path to her own sexual awakening um in this really bizarre and you know um uh, night this was like bizarre nightlife world so uh yeah those are two great films that I would uh, also um love to get a little bit more exposure all right and, and who are those two directors remind us 
Yeah, yeah the, uh, the Day I Became a Woman was directed by uh, Mirzayahi Mashkini. Uh, I mean, you know, totally butchered that name. Uh, and then uh, Variety was directed by Bette Gordon. Excellent, excellent. Like to give uh, those little shout outs out as well. The big meat and potatoes question I've been waiting to ask you. Why did you pick this list? You know, what, what was it that made you say, you know what, I want to do this list? Yeah, I think the reason I really want to do this list uh, is because last list that I was doing, when I was doing my research about the most famous directors and kind of looking at the films that they had made that were uh, sort of under the radar um, or misaligned, um, when I just was doing my research just to Google like most famous directors and uh, women did not come up. Um, and so I, uh, many years ago, I had done a, a year long project to make sure that I had uh, watched nothing but films directed by women. So I had to make sure that I had this education that I understood um, this this part of filmmaking history. This, um, and I started with uh, silent films and I worked my way all the way up to uh, new releases and uh, to make sure that I had kind of built this uh, knowledge for myself. And when I was doing that uh, research for the previous list, I was like, you know what, we need to have this, we need to make this list. We need to talk about these films. Um, so I had to like, kind of call my, um, my, my year long project, kind of go through like the films that I really loved. And, and uh, it, you know, doing that project kind of took me around the world, looking at these Iranian films, these films from Hong Kong or, um, and kind of get a good picture about it. So once we did that last list, I was like, we need to sit down and have talk about a list like this. I like it. I think that's a perfect uh, reason to do it, you know, to showcase like some of your own research and, and your own viewing. And especially because, you know, fuck Google. You know, you type in best directors and only men come up. That's why I say never Google anything. Actually, I say never Google anything for a lot of different reasons, but that's a good reason not to Google anything. I'm not saying use Yahoo or ask Jeeves. I'm just saying fuck Google is what I'm saying. Anyway, side tantrum over. Um, I think this is a great list. And I think any reason is a great reason to showcase an industry that is predominantly male dominated. And let me ask you as, a, I mean, that's a Hollywood um, statement right there, but let me ask you outside of Hollywood, like if you think of Bollywood, if you think of Hong Kong, if you think of Japan, if you think of movies industries around the world, would you say that they are typically uh, male dominated industries like Hollywood or is there variants where there are some other countries that have more gender equality in, in movie making? Uh, kind of I would say overall, yes, they're all still very male dominated, but I think some places to a lesser degree than Hollywood, but not by much. Like, I think uh, surprisingly, um, I say surprisingly, but from our point of view as, as Americans, I think it was surprising to me that Iran had a very rich culture of women filmmakers. Um, and I would say that I have no context for, um, for how easy it is for a woman to make a film in Iran. Um, but given my, like the way, I have been taught to view Iran. I was I was kind of surprised by this, but then kind of digging into the films, uh, many Iranian films are about women, um, and so it is it is uh, kind of refreshing to see that there is at least this culture where they are accepted um, in making films, and uh, there are a good wealth of those films. Um, but yeah, in most other countries like Japan or China or um, maybe or, or in America, I mean, I think in America right now we're starting to see uh, kind of a bloom. Of, of, of women filmmakers, but traditionally, you know, these places around the world, are, they are male dominated. Yeah, and I wanna talk about that, that potential bloom we're seeing now of more female directors and, and ask you, what do you think is maybe the most well-known female directed or female directed movie of let's say like past 30 years or 32 years like 1990 to today like what's a film that you think that almost everyone is going to have heard of that was directed by a woman and I'm kind of curious what your thoughts on this on this yeah that's an interesting question I have uh I have two answers for that because I think one I think maybe the most famous film directed by a woman in this time period would maybe be Point Break the Keanu Reeves Patrick Swayze film but I don't know if the average person on the street knows that it's directed by a woman. Um, so I would say like a film that's out there that maybe most people would recognize as a movie, a popular movie directed by a woman um, is maybe Lost in Translation, the Sofia Coppola film. Um, Such a good film. 
Yes, yes. Um, and so that's what I would say. I think uh, maybe Lost in Translation being, you know, it's got a great setting for an American film, you know, it's just, uh, Americans abroad, but it's got the star power of Bill Murray. And of course, uh, Sophia is from, um, you know, directing royalty. Um, but yeah, maybe that one, but I do think um, Catherine Bigelow's Point Break is probably the most famous film directed by a woman in this time period. Um, just because it's a solid action film. It's a, an iconic action film at this point. And then of course it's got um, Patrick Swayze and Keanu Reeves to the biggest uh, you know, hunks of the nineties in it. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. What do you, I, I struggled to kind of think about this because I wondered um, to get outside of my own head, do you, would you consider Point Break a film that is in the zeitgeist? Um, that people no. recognize as a, as a film directed by women. No, no, I would not. Yeah. Okay. Um, even Lost in Translation, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Now, I think like for us, yes. And I also think because those two movies like hold special places, especially for me, Lost in Translation, I think that's, those are performances from Scarlett Johansson and Bill Murray that you don't see the likes of again. Um, and it deals with so many different dynamics about changing in life and the places we are. I think like it's a profound movie for our generation, um, but I don't know how many people, you know, post 1990s really saw Lost in Translation or go back to it. Um, Point Break, I think people more today know about it because of, you know, the remake that came out a few years back. However, that wasn't hugely popular. So, I mean, I don't know if people like, they heard the name Point Break and then they said, oh, Keanu Reeves, Patrick Spacey, let's go watch this 1990s flick and see what it was about. Um, I think they're both great pools, but I think if I'm going to maybe choose what is probably a movie directed by a woman that's more well known today, um, I would probably say Wonder Woman by Patty Jenkins um, or Wonder Woman 1984 by Patty Jenkins as well. Mm -hmm. um, and in one way, I say like, this is a great thing, but in another way, I also am curious if Wonder Woman isn't a superhero movie or a comic book movie, and we aren't living in a comic book movie age and a superhero movie age where these type of movies are hands down the largest block, uh, blockbuster like movie getters, like they make the most money, you mm -hmm. know, they make billions upon billions of dollars. Um, if Patty Jenkins doesn't do Wonder Woman, which is in that category, does she get picked up at all? as being known you know uh and and i think it, like it's curious when i ask you name me two of the most well-known female directed movies you pulled two movies from the 1990s and while i agree with you completely great films um i don't know how many people know about them and i don't know how many people would know about patty jenkins if she wouldn't have directed wonder woman which is a dc comic book movie yeah yeah and i think she Correct me if I'm wrong. I think she directed that movie Monster, right? With uh, Shirley Theron with the serial killer. Um, I think, I'm unsure. Yes, yes I, I think, okay. yeah. And then uh, Shirley Theron, of course, won the Academy Award for that movie, but that's what that's the history of that movie, right? It's like the, the movie where um, a beautiful Hollywood actor wore a bunch of makeup to be turned into an, an ugly serial killer, not that it's a, a great work of art by a female director. Right, right. Um, you know, I was hard pressed to, to really think. And, and the, the little bitty list that I gave you earlier, you know, with like um, Brie Larson is directing and starring in a movie. Mm -hmm. Also, Brie Larson is extremely well known for what? She's Captain Marvel in the superhero genre. Mm -hmm. um, Angelina Jolie, uh, who directed and starred in uh, By the Sea. Angelina Jolie has been in a whole lot of action set piece movies that are like big blockbuster movies as well. Um, so, you know, I, I'm curious, where are we going moving forward? And, and that's kind of one of my last questions for you is, do you think we are going to start to see more and more inclusivity with directors and women in Hollywood? Like, is that a trend currently going on or is it is it still come somewhat kind of hit or miss? Like sometimes more women are directing, sometimes they're not. Um, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it definitely is uh, on the rise right now. 
Um, one of the biggest films from last year, uh, like in, in the Oscar buzz, the Power of the Dog was directed by Jane Campion. Um, we have the, the Barbie movie coming out this year, directed by Greta Gerwig, which um, is sure to be like a big budgeted Hollywood studio movie. Uh, there's a really great, or at least a great looking film coming out called Don't Worry Darling, directed by Olivia Wilde. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely on the uptick where American cinema is ha has more women making films, and I think we're going to be much better because of that. That's great to hear, and it really does lead me into our last question, our two-part question, kind of the one we always end on, and that's, why is this list specifically important to you, and why should other people view this list as important as well? Uh, it's important to me because, man, these are, these are 10 really great movies. Um, that I don't think get enough love. Some of them in certain circles uh, are praised to death. Um, but I think for the average person, if you haven't heard of these films, definitely go out there and check them out. Uh, they're very near and dear to my heart. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to diversify the films you're watching and uh, to be aware of uh, what you're consuming. And so that's, you know, I think back in 2016, when I did this project, I was like, I really don't know much about this. Um, and I don't know about like what it's, you know, where, where are the female film filmmakers from South America? Where are they in Europe? Where are they in, um, and then in the history of the world, where were they during the silent era and stuff? And so you start to get these different points of view and different uh, feelings about uh, certain things in the world and through watching these films. And uh, I think if you're open to those um, points of view and those experiences, you check these movies out. I couldn't agree with you more the idea that you should be conscious of what you're consuming because film has always been so much in pop culture since its inception, right? Like it's this magical medium where we can see, hear, watch, listen to the lives of the world, right? And we don't have to physically go around the world. Like you said, we don't have to go to you know, South America or Europe or Hong Kong or Japan, but we can watch these films and get so much of what's happening around us. Mm -hmm. But if we're only getting the pictures directed by men, then how much of the world are we really seeing? You know, And so I think you're absolutely right. It's incredibly important to expand who the directors are that we are consuming the films by. Um, and it gives us a, uh, what I think is a more accurate picture of how the world is and how we view it. Um, I dig it. I dig it. And, and like I asked you last time, and you've said it a couple of times, where would be some places that you could find some of these films that you would suggest to people? Yeah, I would say that uh, the Criterion Channel is a good place to start to see a lot of variety of, of films, especially art house films. And they do a really good job of, of making sure they are uh, spotlighting diverse directors and stars and so sometimes they have um limited engagement uh, selections of films directed by african americans or african american women or films from mexico or um and they have a lot of these films directed by women on um in the collection and on the streaming platform uh but uh, again like i think i think a really great tool is uh the library um making sure to go check out stuff that's on disc because a lot of films uh they get taken off of streaming platforms or they're not released on uh, on new Blu-rays or anything like that. And so going to the library and hunting down DVDs of old films is a good way to see a lot of these things. Uh, and of course, if you, have a, if you have a video store in your town, um, I know it may sound archaic to go to a video store, but go support <laughs> your local video store. They're going to have stuff that no one else has. That's how I got to see uh, Song of the Exile uh, many years ago because my video store still had a VHS copy of it in their archive. And so, um, you know, it's like, there are also these libraries of, of uh, cinema history. So, uh, but yeah, there are other uh, streaming platforms like Tubi and the Arrow Player and uh, HBO Max uh, that sometimes get that get good stuff. Um, so yeah, I would recommend those as as sort of a starter, uh, the sort of platforms you should use. Support your local video store and support your local library. I did yes. both of those things. Um, <laughs> and, and he's absolutely right, though, people, because um, I'll use the example of Disney and Disney Plus streaming, right? So you think Disney Plus, you have access to like all the Disney animated films. That's not true. Disney and all streaming platforms that are into movie or cinema or even TV shows, they have what's known as the vault. And the vault contains all of their um, IP, all their intellectual property, all their movies, all their TV shows. 
they do not make access to their vaults open. Like they don't just put all of their content out for you to view at any given time. Some of their material, they deliberately restrict access to for years, sometimes decades. You know, they will keep, um, let's just, uh, movie A, I'm not going to pick a movie. I'm just going to say movie A, okay? Movie A may have came out in 1985 and it was available all the way till 1995. But then a company puts it in the vault and they do not make it available for anyone. So, I mean, if you have it on DVD or VHS, that's one thing, but they're not going to license it out to a Netflix or a Paramount Plus or an Amazon or a Disney Plus. They won't. It's just in that company's vault. And for the next however long they want, let's say they keep it in there for 20 years. Then after 20 years, where they think demand is high enough, they'll release it and they'll put out, you know, they'll accept bids for who wants to buy the licensing to put it on your streaming services for X amount of months or whatever. Um, so there is a lot of content out there that is currently in the vaults of all these different platforms that you can only get if you go to a library or a video store. Um, although good luck finding a video store, my friend. <laughs> do you have one out there where you are? I'm not going to out where you are, but do you? No, not anymore. We had a few, uh, but as the pandemic uh, hit town, they were all gone. Oh, that's tragic. Um, yeah, yeah. Even even the red boxes are getting few and far between. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will say, uh, kind of going back to that, uh, like these platforms, especially like the Criterion channel, um, these are curated platforms. And so these are people you know, who are actively choosing films as opposed to uh, these large corporate streaming services like your Disney Plus or your Peacock or uh, Paramount Plus. Um, and yeah, I mean, when you buy a movie on a disc, you are buying that physical copy of that, but you're really buying the license for that movie. Like you're paying into the license to have it on a disc. You don't actually own it. And it sort of kind of goes towards streaming where it's like they're licensed and they're only licensed for a little bit. So once that license uh, contract is up, it could go to another platform. So while we live in this era of, you know, what seems like endless streaming, there's like endless uh, content, they're really not, you know, it's really not that way. Um, there are a lot of great films out there that have been lost to time because um, they're not licensed and they're not put up on these platforms. And so it is in a way uh, restricting what you are able to see um, as opposed to, to the past where we had video stores and more robust um areas to get things to rent stuff and and um on on dvd or vhs uh so you can see what you want to see not necessarily what uh people are deeming is going to make money to put on their platforms yeah definitely and i will tell like uh, share a little personal story too about like public library um so one of the ones i used to go to uh here in new orleans in uptown they had a dvd collection that i would rent from all the time and it's free first off and you would get six rentals and you get to keep them for a week. And, oh, I don't know, they had maybe 10 shelves that were about, I'd say seven feet tall and were probably like 30, 40 feet long. And the backside of it was filled as well. So, I mean, you're like looking at maybe 10,000 different movies and TV shows. Um, plus, they also had like a kids section that had like thousands of movies too. Um, and different branches have different stuff. So like in and this local libraries generally all work the same. You go look at your local library. If they don't have something, look on their online card catalog and see if another partnering library, like if you live in a, a state with counties, so your county libraries are all together. It could be that another branch and your county has it, and they will send it to your branch for free. You just request it, and then boom, you'll get an email notification when it arrives, and voila, you get the film. Um, so use the internet. Uh, it helps a lot, but you can get a lot of content out there. You can always reserve items at libraries and get even more uh, than what they even have there physically. Yeah. All right, Gregory Day, before we go, I always do like to ask you, what you got going on lately? What you have working on with Hipsville AD? Anything new lately? Yeah, keep an eye out. Uh, the last piece in the Reveal, Real Revenge uh, series is going to be dropping pretty soon, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then we'll be taking a little hiatus before I come back on my next series. 
Interesting, interesting. Any little sneak peeks on what that series may be, or are you keeping that close to the chest? Yeah, a little bit, but I think uh, listeners of this of these lists can get a hint of where of uh, some of my favorite things, and uh, may maybe a good uh, direction of where I'm going next. Oh, in that case, it has to be Hong Kong new wave <laughs> or genre, or maybe a, a Hong Kong genre new wave. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, my friend, as always. And that is Hipsville AD's top 10 list. Check out our friend Gregory Day online. Follow him everywhere, people. This is Pickering and Day signing off. You're not going to say goodbye this time? You oh, always no, say goodbye. No. <laughs> <laughs>